Genau. Genau. Okay, now I got a mute. I'm, I'm good. We're live. Okay, guys. You know we're on StreamYard. There's about a 16 second delay. And the first thing I have to do is I have to always go to my YouTube channel and the Facebook and mute the sound. So when we're speaking, I don't hear <clears throat> our voices coming through my computer because I like to go to the channels themselves and interact. Now, folks, you know the routine. You know how I roll. Number one, the most important thing we can do is be prayed up. Ask the Holy Spirit just to anoint the session. Bless our brother in Jesus Christ, <clears throat> whom, as I said yesterday, behind his back and in front of his face, I consider to be, and I mean this, the leading authority, the most knowledgeable expert scholar on the issues of jihad and the issue of the expansion of Islam militarily as well as the interaction between Muslims and the Crusades. In my estimation, God has blessed you. You're the finest we have. And I don't just say that. Uh, well, I mean that. Thank you very much. And it's the truth. And I know people be blessed. So guys, be prayed up that the Spirit will anoint our brother as he talks about the critical Quran. And I'll show that in a minute. So be prayed up, number one. Number two, hit the like button. Share the links on your social media platforms. Even invite Muslims to try and engage us with their best objections. And then thirdly, when we begin, it's a class setting. If you are distracted by engaging people in the comment section, you're not going to learn. There's always time to engage. There's other platforms. Here is a session where you want to learn the truth, the facts, present them clearly for the glory of Jesus Christ, to get Muslims to see the truth and leave Muhammad, and also to educate Christians about the threat of true Islam, so with that said, brother, before I pray, I just want to say thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us. And people don't know, you don't charge to speak because there are speakers that charge to speak. You come out of the goodness of your heart. So I want the people to bless you. How can they support you, not just by going to your own YouTube channel, but you're in ministry. So do you have like a PayPal link, Patreon, they can bless you financially and help you do this work. Yeah, I do have a Patreon. It's kind of moribund because they banned me and oh. then they unbanned me. And that kind of, uh, oh. as it happened when I got unbanned right then, I got very ill. And so I wasn't, I'd never really did anything with it. I still hope to sometime. Yes. Uh, I'm hoping to step up the videos now, uh, but we'll see how that goes. But I do have the Patreon. Also, you can donate to Jihad Watch at jihadwatch.org. And thank you very much. And we have the link in the description box. And by the way, Brother Protestant Believer, if you want to join and assist, feel free. Let me send him the link. Protestant Believer, don't let the name, you know, fool you. He's also on a journey to the fullness of the truth. He's a good man. He's a blessing to my ministry. He works full time, and yet he manages to find time to help me and upload videos. So if you ever need help, he's great. He does behind Thank the scenes. So Great. Let me invite him. He can join us and he can help us. Here you go, brother. And guys, I won't be taking questions now because I want to go in depth on this. Hold on. Let me show them and I'll pray for us. Hold on. Let me show this. Hold on. Man. The critical Quran. Notice it's critical. <laughs> Warriors come to play. Anyway, that's David Wood. Now, with that said, you do. A weekly show with David Wood, right? That's right. Wednesday nights, tomorrow night. Glory to God. I miss that big luck. When you see him tomorrow, say, Sam Shamoon said, you're still ugly as sin, but you're his second favorite apologist because you're my first, and you're much better looking than him. <laughs> I'm, man, I'm speaking the truth. I don't know. I don't, uh, you're texting in the mail. Glory to God. Let me just ask the Lord to bless us in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you bless your soldier, Robert Spencer. Anoint him by your spirit and bless us all. Anoint us to know the truth and affirm it for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. And we ask that you continue to embolden him to be uncompromising in a world of compromise. He is a voice of truth who will not give in to appease people, exposing the danger of Islam and the beauty of Jesus Christ, the only hope of salvation that not just Muslims, but the world has. So, Lord, guide this conversation. Enable me to ask the right questions 
so that people can come alongside this man prayerfully as well as financially and get his resources to be equipped to destroy Islam politically, <clears throat> theologically, economically. But we are not called to kill people who don't accept the gospel, though we have the right to defend ourselves. That's what Muslims do. Our weapons are mighty in the heavenly realm, so we trust you, Father. And we need you. We need your son, the Lord Jesus, and we need the Holy Spirit to gather us together in the truth and to guide this conversation. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, brother, before we even begin talking about this book, first of all, so that people can know your qualification, because, you know, the Muslims, I'm sure you've gotten it. Who are you? To write a commentary on the Quran, you kafir. <laughs> Even though you're a good-looking kafir. What are your qualifications? So, to give us a little bit about your background. What got you interested in Islam? How many books have you written on the subject? How many years you've spent studying it? What makes you qualified? As far as I know, you don't... Do you speak Arabic? Not too well. Okay, so what makes you qualified, kafir? Come on, give us your history. Tell I us. know a lot of people speak Arabic. All right. So anyway, how did you uh, what happened is my family is from the Ottoman Empire. They were exiled for declining the gracious invitation to convert to Islam. This was in 1916, and uh, the other half of the family left in 1918. Uh, it's under the same circumstances, and they uh, came to the United States. They were Christians, obviously, uh, who didn't want to convert and that was what the empire was doing at the time of its dissolution was considering the uh greek and armenian christians to be yeah. uh, kufar harbi uh infidels at war with islam because they wanted independent states of their own and this was considered to be a rebellion against their submission to the uh Islamic authority, and consequently their lives were forfeit. And so uh, this is a story. These these are things I pieced together over the years. I used to ask my grandparents what life was like over there when they were growing up. And my grandmother and Barack Obama are the only two people that I have ever encountered who said that the Islamic call to prayer was the most beautiful thing they ever heard. Getting and uh, seriously... And, Even your grandmother? Um, yes, she would tell me that she would hear it in the morning, and it was so beautiful, and it was such a beautiful place where they lived, uh, in Chesme, on the coast of uh, very far western Turkey, right on the water. And uh, anyway, the then the inevitable question would be, well, if it was so great, why did you leave? Well, we were exiled. Why were you exiled? Then they would clam up. And I don't know if they didn't know or if they didn't want to tell me, but in any case, after a while, I was able to uh, get the whole story that this was really all about Islam. And that led me to want to study Islam, to understand why such a thing would happen. And, well, that was, I started studying it in earnest in the early 1980s, and mm -hmm. here we are. So uh, and, yeah. As far before as the Arabic we'll thing goes, uh, I was before what now? Before we move on, I wanted to backtrack real quickly because you mentioned yeah, something. Uh, do you have, unfortunately, during World War One, the Armenian, Greek, Assyrian, even Assyrian Chaldean genocide? Do you have family members that were murdered during the time when the Turks and the Kurds slaughtered over one million Armenians, Assyrian, Chaldeans, and Greeks? Yeah, uh, give me give me a second, Sam. Sure, well, be, this is pertinent. Yes, go ahead. Sure. Exactly. Okay. This is a picture that I have on the wall right by my desk. Uh, I know there's glare from the screen. Let me see. Can you wow, see that good. okay? Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. That is uh, my great-grandfather, great-grandmother, and great-aunt, great... Uh, their three children... My uh, grandfather is actually not in the picture. Uh, because, Your child has a gun. Yeah, he's got a gun. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's real, but that's mm -hmm. uh, that's George. Anyway, um, these people are the ones who were exiled. Uh, that's my grandfather's family. 
he was not in i don't know why he's not in the picture i don't think he was the one taking the picture but he's he's not in it anyway uh my great grandfather uh right here uh stiliano sampakos was murdered by a turkish soldier as they were leaving the country they actually had a boat and it was taking them over to crete from uh from chesme and they had gotten into the boat the group that you see there along with my grandfather and uh the uh there was a turkish soldier watching them the whole time and for some reason he forgot something in the house or something he went back and when he went back the turkish soldier who was watching the whole time shot him dead probably thought that there was something in the house like he was going back to get gold from the house or something like that so anyway the rest of them were able to get out uh but uh that is i've never shown that picture publicly before beautiful family you were the first and May his memory uh, their memories be eternal and they're in the presence of our god and savior name the father son holy spirit in jesus name so that's our hope they're alive and they will have their reward at the feet of jesus i'm sorry to hear this Makes well you heart. know sam um it's i think in, important to know that uh well, there are really so many things you can say about this. There is a, when, you know, you hear about a million and a half Armenians or two million and a half Armenians, a million Greeks, 300,000 Assyrians. And like Stalin said, a million deaths is a statistic. A single death is a tragedy, you know? And when you put a face on it, like, like these people, uh, then it becomes a different thing. And of course, yes. they made their way from Crete. They went to France, then ultimately to New York City, where uh, my mother was born. And anyway, this is it's interesting thing because there was an Islamic apologist on Twitter the other day, and he was saying this guy. No, it wasn't actually on Twitter. Excuse me. Uh, I did a show. I'm sorry. You know, Sam, I'm getting old. I did a show. And I'm going to be 50 September 14, brother. Half a century. That's old. So I feel yeah. you. Uh, you were, you were in, in short pants when I was, I was doing, starting doing this, my friend. Um, I, I can't remember the guy. Oh, I think it was a, a gentleman from Nigeria. Mm. Seasoned apologist. A Christian apologist in Nigeria. And I did his show, and and I was very impressed because these people in the comments, they all had these long names, you know, uh, Omentola Akinobe and things like that. And he was just rolling them off like it was John Smith. And I was I was very impressed by this guy. And one of this, this Islamic apologist showed up in the comments, and he'd obviously read Wikipedia or something, some attack piece on me, and he said, you're just doing this because you're angry about your family being exiled. And that's not actually the case. Um, these things, you know, everybody has a tragedy in his family and every people on earth has a tragedy in its history. Most of them more than one. The lesson I learned out of all that was or what I, what I got out of all that happening was a tremendous historical interest in all this and a desire to um, understand because it seemed to me in particular that the Greeks didn't know. And I, I only know this because I asked a lot of them and so I'm not meaning to insult the ones I didn't ask, but I was a very young man in these days and uh Nobody ever, I, I would ask people and they wouldn't know or they wouldn't tell me what had happened and why this was going on. And even after I wrote my first book about Islam, yeah. there was this lady, uh, Sam, are you, am I boring you? <laughs> Sorry, I'm Sam left, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I had to put up the, because the air condition, I don't want to hear background. I'm not in a professional studio. I don't make that kind of money, but go ahead, brother. You're saying? Yeah, you and me both, brother. Yeah. Anyway, uh, 
even after I wrote my first book, the, much later, I encountered a, a, a Greek lady who wrote a wonderful book. I don't want to name her because I don't want to get in some fight. But she wrote a book about her family. And it was the very first time after I had painstakingly assembled all this from my own family's history, it was the first time that I actually read a book where somebody had a similar experience. And her family's experience was exactly the same, except that her family was from the Pontus, from farther east and around the Black Sea, uh, whereas mine was from the coast. And, uh, but exactly the same experience. And she even took her grandmother back to Turkey to the village where they, where she grew up. And they started asking people on the street, where were the Greeks houses? And all the Turks said, there were never any Greeks houses. No Greeks ever lived here. Wow. And so, you know, they've completely erased the history. So I was very moved and impressed by this book. And I wrote to the author. And I said, you know, your book is exactly the same as my family's experience. It was a very powerful, moving experience for me to read it. Thank you so much for writing it. And I myself have written a book explaining why all this happened and why they did this because of Islam. And the lady wrote back a very nasty note saying it has nothing to do with Islam. It was because the Turks are, are, were, were, were being mean. And that was it. And she was resolutely ignorant about the ideological roots of the problem. And I thought, that's a shame, but it's not just her. It's a very common thing. And so, so it was that the, the experience from my family is what led me to try to understand all this. And unfortunately, it was kind of a situation where I felt like I have to do this job because nobody else is doing it. Yeah. So just to understand, so people catch what you said. A lady whose family went through similar tragedy at the hands of Turks. When you told her, the reason was because of Islam. That's the fuel. She got upset and offended saying, and none to do with Islam is just that Turks were being nasty people. So she lived in this bubble and this delusion that Islam is not to be blamed. And you're saying this is a prevalent attitude even from those who suffered at the hand of Muslims? Oh, very much so, yeah. And, you know, she started lecturing me about being bigoted and so on. I, I got to admit, I was pretty upset by her uh, message to the degree that I actually threw her book in the garbage. I thought, well, this <laughs> book, it, 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 it was powerful and moving. But if she's so clueless about this and so rude about this, then I don't need to recon reconsult this book ever. And right. so, uh, you know, maybe that was an overreaction. But um, the thing is, people need to realize why these things happened. And it seems to me there's a tremendous reluctance. I mean, of course, a lot of this is because of the culture we live in. And you know, Sam, uh, the, the, for 20 some years now since 9-11 and even before that, the culture has been just flooded with people saying uh, it's Islamophobic, it's hateful, it's bigoted to look into the motivating ideology behind jihad terror. And so people are afraid to do it. And they even, I think they've internalized this to a tremendous degree and have a kind of knee-jerk reaction that, oh no, we, we can't go there. We have to say it has nothing to do with Islam. It's very important because Muslims are victims. Hmm. So that now puts you on a path. You start in the 80s. Now in the 80s, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have the computer. We didn't have the kind of resources that people now have and are being spoiled. Mm -hmm. So now you want to study Islam. So in the 80s, you started. What yes. did you have to turn to? What were the sources that you consulted to then properly understand Islam, not the Islamic version that we get from the moderates or the liberals in America? So because in the 80s, there was hardly anything. So how yeah, did you... So how I, did you uh, on an accurate study of Islam in the 80s? Tell us a little I bit. I was in graduate school to start with. And I took some courses on Islam. And, you know, it's funny how these guys just lie about everything. And I've even seen it written online. You know, this guy has never studied Islam, doesn't know anything about it. And actually, you know, I was taking courses on Islam in the early 80s at the University, University of North Carolina. They were team taught courses between UNC and Duke University, which was right up the road. 
with uh, Gordon Newby, who is a professor. I think he's still there at Duke University. Uh, he's the author of a big Islamic uh, or the editor of a big Islamic encyclopedia, as I recall. And he's a foremost authority on it, but he's a very he's one of the mainstream authorities. You know, he would uh, I'm sure he would hate uh, if he remembered that I was in his class, yeah. hate the idea that I'm the guy that has written these books. But in any case, I read the Quran, the Pickthal translation. And of course, in the Quran, you see practically every other page, obey Allah and his messenger. Yeah. And I'm notice, I even noticed at that time, there's no messenger. Where's the messenger? Uh, the, how can we, how can, what does it mean to obey the messenger? And I remember asking about that, and we were given a book uh, called Muhammad's People that is edited by a scholar named Eric Schroeder, and it is kind of a, it's, it's sort of Hadith written out as if it's a single story. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of well done. Um, and in any case, I'm going on too long, but that led me into led me into reading Bukhari mm -hmm. and Muslim. And this was at that time going into the library and, you know, finding Siddiqui's translation of Sahih Muslim right. in the stacks and sitting there and just not having any idea and just reading it. And I found that there was a chapter on Jihad in, in Bukhari and in Muslim and so on. And so I guess the next thing is the, uh, uh no you it's can, not yeah, yeah just ignore the comments i'm putting on i'm just doing it for the future reference these are not questions but yeah, see i'm an old man sam i'm 10 10 years older than you and losing my train of thought it's a very easy thing okay. um, yeah but you're anyway, saying you went to the library you read bukhari muslim you checked their section on jihad because at that time in the late 80s early 90s they're starting okay. to translate bukhari muslim i was interested in uh khomeini khomeini mm. was the big jihadi then you know and yes. the iranian revolution and the hostage crisis and all that and actually you know i was at the university of north carolina sam i'm telling you all these stories i've never told in public before Thank i was in the sure. university of north carolina i was a freshman i just told that story what are you talking about mr spencer how did you get interested in islam that's what i've been it's talking okay. about Take a little late guys anyway, yeah. re rewind <laughs> Start from the beginning here it explained it remember the yeah. man is getting old he's older than david wood but better looking right so let him Way focus up. darn it anyway uh this is a little bit before this but 1979 i started college at the university of north carolina and that was right at the time of the hostage crisis and uh <laughs> there are these guys that i roomed with they were a couple of farm boys from rural north carolina it was a big mismatch you know, uh, but it was just the luck of the draw. And uh, they said that I looked just like this guy who was this Jordanian exchange student who had come to their farm to study farming. And his name was Hazim. And so I've come into come into the room and I say, have beer, Hazim. <laughs> and uh, they'd say, we're, we're going to lock Hazim in the closet until they let them hostages free. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, um, this was something that was obviously still going on. Obviously, the Islamic Republic is still going on uh, even now. And so I was very interested in trying to see once I started reading the Quran and reading the Hadith, is what the Islamic Republic doing Islamic? Is what the Ottoman Empire was doing? at the end of world war one is it was it islamic and of course you go into it you get it you find the right material you can see of course yes all it 100 it all is and so uh anyway that's how it all started that's a long time ago I never thought i was going to write any books about it that's what's that going to be my next question how did you then go from there studying to know the true face of islam to getting actively involved and being a voice and then writing books in the 90s I started to, uh, I guess you're right. I, I shouldn't look at the comments. In the 90s. Okay, I'll try not to put them down. I don't want you to get confused because I want you to focus. In the 90s, I was writing 
and uh, I was also, I had to make a living, you know, I was writing advertising. And one of the people I worked for was a publishing company, and they published books about all kinds of stuff. And mm -hmm. so the guy who was the head ad writer, he said, tell me things you're interested in, just whatever you're interested in. And then when we get books about that stuff, I will give them to you to review. Mm -hmm. And you can write us reports about these books. And mm -hmm. so I told him Islam was one of the things. And so they gave me books to review by people like Pipes, Daniel Pipes, Bernard Lewis, the people who were writing about Islam at the time. And Daniel Pipes was writing even before you were actively writing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. A lot of people – see, a lot of people don't know who Daniel Pipes is. I know he's a secular Jew, if I remember, and he's also – very friendly to the Christians, and he is a voice warning about the dangers of political military jihad. But I didn't know that he was active even before you were, because I actually ran into you and Pam Geller and him around the same time. Pipes and Steve Emerson were the first guys who were really on this. Bernard Lewis was writing a lot of books. I still got all my Bernard Lewis books over here. Uh, mm -hmm. Bernard Lewis was writing histories of Islam and Jihad, and I encountered Batya Or in the 90s, and Ibn Warak. I read mm -hmm. Why I'm Not a Muslim, and uh, The Decline of Eastern Christianity Under Islam by Batya Or. That one was heartbreaking because Eastern Christianity is my family, you know? And um, Bernard Lewis was writing histories, but I find Bernard Lewis very unsatisfying to read because he marshals all the evidence and makes an irrefutable case and then never comes to a conclusion. He never, he, he, he tells you two plus two a hundred times and never says four. But anyway, uh, and also because he discounts the whole reality of dimitude, of, of the, the subservience of the non-Muslims in Islamic society. And, you know, I knew that from my family's experience. And so I knew that he was wrong about that. And Batya Or was right in what she was writing about Dimitude. But anyway, um, yeah, Emerson, of course, Steve Emerson, who's still active, uh, he was a reporter and he was covering something and he got bored and went over to the next thing. You know, some he was covering some conference and he went over to the next conference and it was one some Islamic groups conference. And he found he starts picking up their literature kind of at random and finds all this hair raising pro jihad stuff. And so he started to write about it. But Emerson and Pipes do not deal with Islamic doctrine. And when it came to 9-11, what happened was the people that was working for the publishing house, they contracted to do a book with this guy who, I don't know why he did this. I would never do this. And I've never done this. I've written 26 books now. And I've never done this. And I never will. But he was sending in his chapters as he finished them. I would never do that because I might want to go back and change something uh, after I've written something else later. But he was apparently very confident. And so uh, my boss was running the chapters by me and saying, what do you think of this? And I was saying, this is a lot of hogwash because this okay. guy was saying, uh, this is, Muhammad would have been horrified by 9-11. And I said, Muhammad would have loved 9-11. Are you kidding? It's just the kind of thing that he would have absolutely loved. It's like high bar. It's like so many other things. And anyway, to cut to the chase, the guy finally says, we're going to drop this book, and I need you to write one best to replace it. And I said, I can't do that. I'm nobody. Wow. Nobody's gonna, and he said, forget about that. Don't worry about that. I'll take care of all that. Just write it. Wow. And so wow. I wrote it in a frenzy. I had it done by middle of December 2001. And that was my first book. What was the name of it? Islam Unveiled. Okay, guys, you see that? You're getting inside scoop never before shared. Oh, what a privilege and an honor. So pray for this man. He was critiquing chapters of the book that turned out to be hogwash. So the publisher said, okay, we're going to ban this guy. and You're going to write the book. And the first book he wrote, Islam Unveiled. Now, so we can get to this most important monument. 
How many books have you written since then? That was in the 90s, right? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. This is after September 11th. Yeah, that was, that was right after 9-11. Yes, so uh, after 2001, you wrote your first book. Yes. How and many? Now, I'm working on number 27 right now. Woo! I'm a now third we're going of the to show your Amazon page. Now, that's why I thank our brother, Protestant Believer. Protestant, bring up the page. I gave him the link to Amazon where they can purchase this book. So Protestant, my brother, from a different mother like no other. So here he goes. This is it on Amazon. He's going to enlarge the screen if you can. This is it. Now, my precious brother in the Lord can't do this for everyone. He's not rich. I'm not rich. We do not have a multi-million dollar organization. So he was kind of because he knows I'm a broke apologist. I'm broke and ain't no joke. I don't make the money that David Wood does. Just kidding. Don't tell myself that. He sent me a complimentary copy of this. So there it is. The Critical Cron. Now, here's the thing, though. When you click on his name, author name, Robert Spencer, he's going to click on it. He sees it. If you want to enlarge it a little more, Protestants, okay, don't be scared. Don't be scared of a large screen. He's going to click on it. It's going to take you to his page. If he's going to open it up, if he can. Is it open it up for you, brother, or do you want me to get it for you? You got to hit where it says visit Amazon's Robert Spencer page. Yes, I have it there. So you think he gets there nervous you with me because we have a long history. And he gets scared with me, like, oh, Sam's going to snap. Okay, I know, he, you know, I help him, but he's always snapping at me, and I'm sensitive. Now, scroll down, you're going to see all the books. Now, he just came up with a book that should pique you the interests of the Catholics and the Orthodox. Scroll down, and I'm going to bring him to give his case why he believes it, and I'm going to bring others to give <clears throat> their understanding. This just came out, The Church and the Pope, The Case for Orthodoxy. It just published August 21st. 2022. Un unbeknownst to me, I didn't even know that. Now, scroll down to see the other books. There's the critical Quran, right? There it is. Did Muhammad exist? Second edition, right? Yeah, expanded. Expanded That's edition. I had to buy it with the pennies no, that I've been collecting you. over the years. Next time, brother. This is the older version. Don't get the older version. That's no, the that's old the truth about Muhammad. That's not the older version. Oh, I apologize, my friend. See, because that tells me a different book. Sorry about that's that. I'm getting old. old. See, I'm getting as old as you. I'm forgetting. Okay, yeah, go it. back up again. Go back up again, uh, Protestant, just to make sure. Okay, yeah, they're not Muhammad the same. Book. My apologies. See, did did Muhammad exist? Discusses the historical value of the early Islamic sources about Muhammad. And then if you go down, scroll down. Pradi, thank you. Yep. The truth like about that. Muhammad is a, is the Islamic sources about Muhammad. And so this is a biography of Muhammad based on the Islamic sources. And then did Muhammad exist is an evaluation of whether those sources have any historical value or not. Yeah. And Just so I can confirm to people, you take the position similarly to Jay Smith. You don't believe that the Muhammad of Islamic tradition existed. There may have been a Muhammad, but the stories are 100 years removed from the time Muhammad supposedly lived, so they cannot be relied upon. And you do believe there is a Christian undertext to the Quran, right? Yeah, to some of it, not all of it. Yes. So that's your belief. Just want people to know. So get his book. Now, I remember, I'm, I'm getting old too, I'm forgetting, but I'm not forgetting as much as Prat. So I remember when I interviewed you, you mentioned this. This book, The Truth About Muhammad, led a Muslim apologist to leave Islam and return to his Christian faith? Yeah. Share that but, story. Well, Sam, it's a sad story. Oh. Because really? uh, I'll tell you what happened. Um, this, that was, th this book came out, Truth About Muhammad, came out in 2006. And this guy who was an award-winning Islamic apologist, he really had won awards. He was like the top Muslim blogger some year back then. And he used to write me nasty emails, you know, and we would joust back and forth. And then he uh, he told me that he had read this and it had uh, opened his eyes and he left Islam. However, and, you know, he asked me to write to sign one to his mom and send it to his mom because he said his mother was so worried about him when he was a Muslim and so on because he was a convert to Islam to start with. But uh, recently he was in the news again. Oh, wow. And uh, he apparently has returned to Islam. I wrote wow. him, but he didn't answer. 
he was in the news because of something. What did he attack somebody or I don't know what, what happened was uh, there was a head of a chapter of care, the council on American Islamic relations. Mm -hmm. And he was unmasked as an informer for Steve Emerson's investigative project on terrorism. And care was very upset. I mean, really nothing illegal was done. It was just that he was giving information to Emerson. And as this story was developing and as it broke, it turned out that the guy we're talking about was also giving information to Emerson. And so he said, he made a statement. He said, I want to ask my brothers and sisters in Islam to forgive me. And, you know, Allah well, was giving me a hard time. Well, yeah, I, uh, I don't know what's going on with him. Um, but it was pretty disappointing and I'm sorry that he didn't answer my emails, but, yeah. uh, he's got to do what he's going to do. Yeah. Anyway. I, I, think, I think in regards to that, it's more a fear of getting murdered by Muslims than a genuine return because even then, so people understand the man that the Lord used Robert Spencer to leave, cause him to leave Islam through this book, he was providing information, inside information to Steve, Steve Emerson who's also one of the leading voices exposing jihad, that tells me that he was an undercover Muslim who wasn't a genuine Muslim, but when his cover was blown, he now a fear of being murdered. He's now apologizing. So I don't think it's a genuine return. I think he's afraid he's going to get murdered. Because, you know, in the West, Muslims don't care. They'll try to murder you. So Go to the history of jihad. That's that's the other yeah, big show book. Him. Scroll down, brother. Let's look at the other book. Comp that's yeah, it that's right there. there. The history of jihad. There is no other history of jihad in the world today. That is the comprehensive history of jihad covers the jihad, not just in the Europe. You you find books about the jihad in Europe, but this book covers the jihad in India, the jihad elsewhere. It's the whole story. And so uh, excellent. I, I people will read that because, you know, most of the time, Islamic apologists they only concentrate, and also so do Christians who talk to Muslim, talk to Islamic apologists. They only concentrate on the Quran and Muhammad. And even uh, there was even a guy, Asadullah, who he he started making videos when this book came out in 2018. Right. He started making videos about how he was he was going to refute it. You know, he was going to show that it was all wrong. And I knew I, I I I saw them. People were sending them to me and saying, "See, see, now you're now you're destroyed. You're ruined. You uh, you've been exposed." And so I started watching one of them, the first one, and the first chapter of this book, the history of jihad. It's uh, it's called "I've Been Made Victorious Through Terror," which of course is a quotation from Muhammad yep. in the Hadith. And so. Uh, this guy spent all this time saying Muhammad didn't mean terror like terrorism. He meant the awe, the fear of God. That's how he was made victorious. And I thought, yeah, tell it to the people he raided at Kaibar and to 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 all the people that he ordered killed and to all the, the you know, all the people whose lives were destroyed by Muhammad. He it's very clear what kind of terror he meant. If you look at the Islamic sources. So I thought this guy's ridiculous and I didn't watch any more of the videos, but I also knew he ain't going to deal with the history. He's going to make a video about the Quran chapter and a video about the Muhammad chapter. And then he's going to stop because there's no way nobody's covered the history before and they don't have an apologetics apparatus to explain it all away. And sure enough, he stopped. His videos are only about the Quran chapter and the Muhammad chapter. All the rest of the book he ignored. Beautiful. That's why, guys, you need to get the book because he's going to give you the history of how they expanded Islam by murdering people, enslaving people, taking over lands, and people who pose no threat to Muslims. So just that section would be worth the price of the book. So now, glory to God. With that said, we're going to get into, I don't know if you want to say this is your magnus opum. Is magnum it? opus. Okay, see, I'm, I'm trying to sound intelligent. Here you rain on my parade. <laughs> Well, if I uh, didn't say anything, then it would be even worse because then oh, they, would, they would say, see, both these guys, they don't know. Yeah, yeah. Last. So, and that's what I'm doing. I'm sacrificing my reputation to make you look good. I mean, what else? That's that it? It's like, see, so here goes. Now, <laughs> here's the question. Yes, sir. 
There are many Qurans out there done by Muslims, non-Muslims, and there is the only one that I'm aware of that's a Christian commentary. It just came out by Gordon Nickel, Sondervan. Okay, why did you decide to come up with a Quran where you provide notes? And <clears throat> why <clears throat> should someone be interested? And what do you have to say about the Quran? Come on, tell us why. I mean, you're a Kafir, dude. Yes, so indeed. why did you decide to do this? And how would it benefit someone to get your critical Quran and read your notes? Why would your notes be important? And how does it help? specifically the Christians to know the true face of Islam? Okay, very excellent question, Sam. Thank you. In the first place, I wrote the book because I wanted to have it and it did not exist. Mm. That's the best reason to write any book. And I've tried to do that. I haven't done that with all my books, but most of them lately, especially, they're books that I wanted to read that didn't exist, so I had to make them. Now, this book I wanted to make, wanted to write because there was no good translation of the Quran. Mm. I've been reading the Quran since the early 80s. That's 40 years now. I've read Pictal. I've read Ali. I've read, uh, I got 30 Quran translations back here uh, on my shelves. I've read them all. None of them are good. They, some of them are good in some ways. Some of them are good in others. But none of them, they all have big weaknesses. You know, uh, Pictal is generally okay, but he's written in the fake King James Bible, 17th century English. Yeah, people don't speak really that way anymore. It's hard to understand. I kind of think people didn't work, didn't speak that way in 1918 either. And that he wrote it that way in order to obscure the meaning and not to make it clear. Because he knew that a lot of the things that people would read in the Quran would shock them. And he didn't want it clear. And Abdullah Yusuf Ali, same thing, 1934. Same thing, archaic language and apologetic intent such that he adds in stuff like, well, the most notorious example, the one I always cite, is 434, where it says, beat them about disobedient women. And, it's, and Abdullah Yusuf Ali says, beat them lightly. Yep. There ain't no lightly in the Quran. Yeah. And all the Qurans, even some of the good ones, I like our berries very much, but our berry says God for Allah. Yeah, and while does. I understand that, I understand that etymologically. At the same time, I don't believe that it's the same uh, theological entity and that it's misleading to people to use the same word. Like and so. uh, in any case, uh, most of the Qurans, including our berries, they add in Muhammad all the time where it says, say, say this yeah. to the unbelievers. And they say, say this, Muhammad, to the unbelievers. Well, why are you doing that? Muhammad is only mentioned four times. And maybe there wasn't any Muhammad. Maybe it's not addressed to him. Maybe it's somebody else. You're prejudging the case by doing that. I wanted to get a Quran that just had the English in a clear language and only had the English that corresponded as close as I could get it to what the Arabic said. Now, and just to, show, to confirm what you're saying, not to cut you off, because you said, uh, you saw, like, he's going, we hear, guys, I gave you the link. This is the browser that belongs to the Answering Islam website. Put in 434, 434, just to show what you're saying so we can show them visually. No, brother, not Arbery, all of them. See, it's okay. Prod is learning. He's still coming to the fullness of the truth. We need to be patient. But you see, Arbery's got God all over that. Yeah, exactly. So he's going to remove the – no, no, don't don't, don't put him in. Just undo them and it all come up. Love you, buddy. Now click submit. So here we're going to look at Yusuf Ali and Arbery for a contrast. Here it is, 434. Wait, hold on. I know the what you're doing, Sam, but give me a second, okay? Because yes. pick ball was first. Go oh, back so you up want, to – You want pick some. Okay, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You're right. This is your show. But I just saw this. I thought, this is what I'm talking about. Spend of their property, in parentheses, for the support of women. It doesn't say for the support of women in the Arabic. Good. It just says spend of their property. You might say, well, obviously that's what it means. Obviously that's the import. All I wanted to do in the critical Quran was actually show what the book actually says and no more and no less. 
And so it doesn't have these parenthetical things. And Yusuf Ali's got many more. Go to Yusuf Ali now. Okay, so you tell us which one, because we have here Bukthal, Yusuf Ali, Lali Khan, Rashad Khalifa, Arbery, Palmer. We have some of them. Now go to Yusuf Ali. Now here. here Look at this Beat one. Them you guys catch it? This is what he's talking about. These Quran translations, many of them by Muslims, will add comments in parentheses or brackets that are not in the Arabic. So notice when it says, beat them, how do you do it? Lightly, in parentheses, right? And you're saying it's not in the Arabic, right? Right, it's not in the Arabic. And, you know, we hear an awful lot of apologetic nonsense in the West about how Muhammad was brushing his teeth and he holds up his miswak, his tooth stick, yeah. and says, yeah. that's what you beat her with. That's a lot of hooey. The average Muslim guy who reads 434, he, he doesn't know or care about that stuff. He sees that it says beat them, and there aren't any limitations on that. Uh, Go to Arbery. Yeah, Arbery's but I just noticed in Pickthall it says scourge them. Scourge them. That's yeah, a good scourge one. them is pretty tough. Yeah, but go to the Arbery because here's his problem with Arbery. Even though he says it's good, he doesn't translate the Arabic term Allah. He doesn't retain it. He translated God. So here it is, Arbery. Men are the managers of the affairs of women for that God has. So this is his problem because he's telling you it should have been Allah, even though he translates it correctly where it says beat them. So now that said, Arbery's misleading also because see how he says God has preferred in bounty. One of yes. them over another. Well, what yep. does that mean, preferred in bounty? That means they got more stuff. And so Palmer's is better, where it says men stand superior to women. Beautiful. And so that's what the critical Quran says. Rodwell has the same thing. And Arbery is alighting that, making it harder to see that this verse specifically says men are superior to women. Yep. But it does. Well, and it also Let says me contrast that with what yours. Women. Now, let me read yours yeah. so you can see. This is his. This is page 70, and I'm going to ask you what translation you use, but we'll get to that. I just want to read the difference now. This is his. This is a new translation. Who is it? This is a new translation. So that's why I want the people to know. You didn't use an existing translation. You made a fresh translation. Yes. Good. So now I'm going to read your translation. Men are in charge of women because Allah has made the one superior to the other. It's page seven. Page 70. Right? Yep. And because they spend of their property. So good women are obedient, guarding in secret what Allah has guarded. As for those for whom you fear disobedience, give them a warning and banish them to separate beds and beat them. Then if they obey you, do not seek a way against them. Indeed, Allah is always high, exalted, great. So just so people understand, you didn't use any existing translations. You made a fresh translation to try to be as accurate to the Arabic. You didn't insert words in parentheses and brackets. You just translated warts and all. But now this leads me to this question. Then. And then because I want to also talk about what was the main theme you focused on. Some will say, well, what are your qualifications to translate the Arabic Quran? How'd you do it? Why should we trust it? Yeah, absolutely. And the answer is because I'm in touch with a lot of people. Who helped some of them do not wish to be actually all of them do not wish to be named and i'm going to honor that because like, i'm talking about native arabic speakers but also uh i've been studying this for an awful long time and people say well you know you don't speak arabic yes but they act as if i can't read it i can't make it out i have no idea no acquaintance with it whatsoever this is just false and i know where the controversial parts are where the words that are disputed are, and I brought all that out. And I ran it by these native Arabic speakers, and they compared it with the Arabic. I also consulted the line by line. Somebody mentioned it. You can see a word by word translation at Quran Corpus at Quran.com. They have the word by word business, and that was very helpful. Uh, now they're going to take it down now that I've said that. Uh, and, uh, good job. <laughs> you remember a few years back, I don't know if you remember, but actually it was about 20 years ago now, the University of Southern California had a very helpful uh, yeah. online database. Yeah, I used it all the time, man. And I used it all the time. And I think they noticed that the only people that were using it were uh, the people who were who were arguing against Islam. Good and job, so, Spencer, yeah. getting these sites shut down. I'll say something bad about that word for it. It sucks. We hate it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so if you say you don't like it, they'll keep it up. Come on, man. Yeah. We need resources. But yeah, it's terrible. Saying, we hate it. But yeah. anyway, yeah, I'm uh, perfectly confident in the translation and very happy with it, as a matter of fact. And then, of course, there are the notes. And the yeah. notes are from not my opinion. You know, you were asking me uh, why, you know, why should we care what you say about the Quran? And that's a very important question. I don't give what I think about the Quran. I give what Ibn Kathir thinks or Qurtubi or the Tafsir al-Jalalain, all these various sources that a Muslim would consult if he's studying Islam and wants to understand his religion in more depth. So I'm giving you in the notes the mainstream understanding of these passages from Islamic tradition. So because people always say, you know, oh, you're, uh, no, they're not taking down Quran corpus. We were just saying, if I say I like it, they'll take it down. Uh, as far as I know, they're not taking it down. Relax. Hopefully anyway, not. If they do, I'm going to yeah. sue you, Spencer. Yes, it. it'll yeah. be my fault. But anyway, uh, the notes are designed to circumvent the common objections that people always get. That if you quote a Quran passage, they'll say, oh, but you're taking it out of context. You don't understand how we understand this in Islam. Okay, so this book gives you how they understand it in Islam. Beautiful. Now, to add to that, because this is a massive book, over 6,000 verses, I'm sure your goal wasn't to give a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of every passage. You were selective. You had a goal. You were focusing. So what was the main focus? What did you focus particularly when you decided, I'm going to provide a commentary for this verse, but not for that one? Because obviously the goal wasn't to go through every single verse and give a commentary because you wanted an accurate translation, but also relevant notes to expose the true teachings of Islam. So what did you focus on primarily throughout your commentary? Well, I think that if you have a verse by verse commentary in the, on the Quran, it would be needlessly lengthy and tedious because the Quran is so repetitive. Yep. And so... A lot of times you will find in the critical Quran on a passage, it'll say, see chapter whatever else. And that's where I explain it in more detail. I was looking for simply passages that were consequential in various ways. Passages that jihadis use to justify jihad. Passages that are used in Islamic apologetics. Passages that are of historical interest because they show the sources of the Quran various things of that kind and uh you know usually a study bible doesn't have a, a comment on every last verse and this right. doesn't either but i do think that i covered most of the important aspects of the book and for people to know the most important aspects for us would be the social political economic and military aspects of islam there i mean even the theological but as far as the west is concerned and the freedoms we enjoy, which we're not enjoying anymore, and they're going to be gone eventually. So people realize that a great focus of your work, it, even, it, it does involve theology. You even wrote a book on how they cherry pick Old Testament passages to justify jihad. So you do discuss theology. But one of the main concerns that I've seen you engage is Islam's threat socially, politically, economically, militarily. So yes. when people pick this up, they're going to see you talk about that in depth, correct? Yeah, because like, uh, for example, one of the things that I do is not translate the word jihad. Beautiful. Where it says jihad in the Arabic, it says jihad in this book. There's one exception, but uh, it's not important. Really? It's, uh, it's when it's actually used. I, I was actually surprised to see it uh, because I hadn't really thought about it before or noticed it. But the word jihad being used in a in the context of unbelievers working. Uh, but in any case, for the most part, when the verse is jihad fi sabil Allah, jihad for the sake of Allah, which in Islamic theology is unmistakably warfare against unbelievers, then I you leave it as jihad. Whereas most translations will say, strive hard in the way of Allah. And that's yes. completely misleading to the English speaking non-Muslim reader. They don't know that strive hard in the way of Allah doesn't mean pray and, and fast. It means pick up a gun or a knife and go fight. And so I wanted it to be very clear in this book, it says wage jihad in the way of Allah. And these passages, I don't think have ever been translated that way before. 
or rather not translate it, but it's in order to make it clear what the justifications are that jihadis look for in the Quran and how they how they make recruits among Muslims and how they justify their own actions by referring to the Quran itself. Good. Now, this guy asked this question five times now, and I'm about to pull out my nose hairs because I have no hair on the top of my head. Is there going to be a Spanish uh, translation? There's no uh, plans for that at the at this point. Translations are really tough. Uh, the publisher owns the foreign rights, and I've had a lot of people, especially uh, in India, great interest in India, people asking if it can be translated into Hindi. I'd love to see that. That would be wonderful. The problem is you not only have to have a translator, you have to have a publisher. And in India, as well as in Spain, very hard to find a publisher because the publishers don't want to get blown up. Yeah, and exactly. So uh, it's, it's nothing's in the works at this point. I'd love to see it. I hope it happens someday. Which makes me want to ask, why would they even, this publisher, even risk publishing this knowing that the Muslims are going to try to kill anyone associated with this book, much like they did with Salman Rushdie, which we'll talk about. So why would they take a risk in publishing this? I don't know. You, I'm, right. I'm, 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 Kudos, I'm proud of that. They, yeah, I'm grateful that they do. These, this, this is a publisher that approached me uh, about five years ago. They were just getting going and were interested in publishing books by Great me. Time. I'm very grateful to have them. You know? Amen. That's why I'm, I'm proud that they didn't care because you and I both know the consequences, which leads me to a few more questions relevant to your book and your expertise. First of all, talking about jihad, you remember the challenge. Jamal Badawi. The word for warfare is, what do you say? Al Muqaddasa, Al Harb Al Muqaddasa, holy war. You remember the challenge? He gave a challenge. He's saying, the Quran doesn't say war, holy yeah. war. Al Harb Al Muqaddasa, that doesn't exist. You're lying, you cappers. How do you respond to the assertion that the word for war is Harb and there is no such thing as you know, calling to a holy war, which would be Al-Harb Al-Muqaddasa, or Al-Muqaddasa Al-Harb, whatever you say. How do you respond to that? Come on, he got you. He knows Arabic. He's a <laughs> That's on, funny. You know, Sam, you take me back. I haven't thought about Jamal Badawi in years, but back at the time that he issued that challenge, I told him, hey, here you go, and gave him a bunch of uh, jihad verses in the Quran and said, where's my, what was it, $10,000? You can send yeah, it here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, he still hasn't paid. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, oddly enough, he was. Uh, there are an awful lot of Islamic apologists who rely on the ignorance of the non-Muslim, and he yeah, was one of them. And yeah. the fact is that you're right. Al Harb al Muqaddasa does not exist in the Quran, but it's very clear in the passages on jihad that we're talking about warfare and not an interior spiritual struggle. Exactly. My well, favorite well, example. Well, what's that? And it's not that about doing UFC mixed martial arts. Stri strive with your opponent, get a you know bout in UFC for the championship. We know it's warfare, knives, bombs, everything. But go ahead. Well, my favorite example is chapter eight, four, verse forty-one, which tells the Muslims that they have to give a fifth of the spoils of war to Muhammad. Now, how do you do that, or to the messenger? How do you do that with the? Or actually, I think that is one of the ones that says. Anyway. Uh, how can you have spoils of war for an interior spiritual struggle? See, this yeah. is what I'm disappointing in you. You know why? In UFC, when you get your paycheck, you can give a fifth of your paycheck. That's the spoils of the war in the octagon. Come on, Kaffir. Allah was foreseeing yeah. UFC and the mega purses that they make. Right? Also, 860 does say steeds of war, war horses yep. that you use to strike terror in the hearts of the enemies of Allah. And so uh, it's very clear. There are all kinds of passages that make it clear that it's worth. And let me read it from your translation so I can people can see. Yep. Here it is, chapter 8, verse 60. I'm going to read 860 and 841. Only problem is I'm getting old, Robert. I need glasses, man. You're killing me with the small print. Make ready for them. 860, this is his translation, first translation. Make ready for them all that you can of force and of war horses, because the horses are not there to go, you know, you know, just riding. So that by them you may strike terror in the enemy of Allah and your enemy and others beside them 
whom you do not know, Allah knows them. Whatever your speed, whatever you speed in the way of Allah, spend. Speed. See, I told you I need glasses, man. I'm blind. Whatever you spend in the way of Allah, it will be repaid to you in full, and you'll not be wrong. Now, 841, chapter 8, 41 in this translation. And know that whatever you take as spoils of war. Oh, come on, it's UFC. What are you talking about? So you're mistranslating. Spoils of war. Indeed, a fifth of it is for Allah and for the messenger and for the relatives and for orphans and the needy and the traveler. If you believe on Allah and what we reveal to our slave on the day of Furqan, you left that untranslated, untranslated yeah. too. That's the all day the new army met, and Allah is able to do all things. So with that said, why didn't you translate the word Furqan? Like you didn't translate Furqan. the word Jihad. Furqan is an ambiguous word that is one of the words, and there are many of them in the Quran. I, I, I deal with all of them in the uh, critical Quran. It doesn't really have a meaning that's clear. It has a meaning by consensus of the Islamic theologians. It does not have a meaning that arises from the word itself. In other words, these guys came to Furqan and they had no idea what it meant. And it's it's like Sijin, in other words, in the Quran, that uh, it, it, it's not Arabic. People don't know what it is. And so they assigned a meaning to it. And it has become conventional in Islamic theology. Mm. But it's not based on any pre-Quranic usage of the word itself. I see. And so that's the one advantage of your translation, the non-Arabic words that were taken from Hebrew, Syriac, Aramaic, you left untranslated because you don't care what later Muslim scholars coming hundreds of years later said the word meant because historically these are foreign words that at the time, even those who supposedly knew Muhammad, they, saw, they were all over the map. So when you found these words, you just left them untranslated. Yes. All right. With, with explanations in the notes. So you're not just out at sea thinking this is half a translation with the other half in Arabic. It's it's all explained in the notes how people th say it's criterion, people yeah, say it's yeah. this and that, and it's used in these various ways in the Quran. It's all there. And you know what's ironic? Because I speak an offshoot of Aramaic. I speak a dialect of Syriac. Some say that it's an Aramaic word or Syriac word. We use the word purqana for salvation. Furqan, and that's one of the meanings assigned to Furqan because, again, it's a loan word. Now, I'm going to catch you, though. I'm going to use your own Quran. Scholars have told me Islam does not teach offensive expansionist Islamic jihad that you can only attack if you're attacked or if, let's say, there's an oppressor or a tyrant attacking, let's say, a Muslim land, then you have the right to fight. But there is no expansive <clears throat> military <clears throat> exhortation to spread Islam and attack people who have done you no harm, pose no threat, offensive jihad, what we call. You can only defend yourself or defend Muslim lands from tyrants. And here's a proof. Chapter 2, verse 256 from your own Quran, mister. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 256. I want to see if you can refute your own translation. Oh, Surat al-Baqarah. Chapter 2, verse 256. And by the way, he has notes on these, by the way. So I'm not reading notes because he's here explaining their historical contextual meaning. But here, chapter 2, verse 256. There is no compulsion in religion, you kafir. There is no compulsion in religion. The right distinction is from now on, distinct from error. And he rejects tahut. There you go, you coward. You don't want to translate the meaning. See how you are? But you got to know <laughs> about it. And believes in Allah, has grasped a firm handhold which will never break. Allah is hearer, knower. So even in your Quran, there is no compulsion religion, right? Even though you got something called tahut, what is that? Is that, is that like, it's is an that Ethiopic like, word. Luka? It's an Ethiopic word. Okay. So go ahead. Um, Explain. Islam doesn't tell you to go attack people and subjugate them just for the sake of you know, their religion. You can only attack them if they attack you or oppress Muslims. Come on now. Refute me. Okay. Well, in the first place, if you look at the notes, you see that some people think that 2256, I'm talking about some Islamic authorities, say that 2256 was abrogated 
by 2193 to fight until religion is all for Allah, which of course is also echoed in 839. If you're fighting until religion is all for Allah, then you got to wage offensive warfare because a lot of people whose religion is all for Allah, they're going to leave you alone. And so you have to go bother them and make sure that their religion, that whose religion is not all for Allah, rather. You, you, there are people in the world whose religion is not for Allah, and they're not going to ever bother the Muslims, but the Muslims have to bother them and make mm -hmm. sure that the religion is all for Allah. Wow. And so 2256, there's no compulsion in religion, has never been understood as overriding the offensive imperative. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't even override forced conversion as far as many Muslims are concerned. And we saw that some years ago, there was a Fox News reporter and photographer, and they were captured by jihadis, and they were converted to Islam, and they made a video. Uh, the jihadis made a video of uh, these guys converting to Islam, and they're saying, I am converting of my own free will. I am not being co coerced, and they got a gun to their head the whole time. <laughs> Now, it's absurd. It was a comedy, but how can you say they were not compelled? There's no compulsion in religion because they could have chosen to die. Uh, that's they the meaning. They chosen to be shot through the head. Uh, and so they freely chose not to be shot through the head. They freely chose Islam. No compulsion in religion. Wow. So hold on. Did I hear you right? That... They have an option, be murdered or become Muslim. So there's no compulsion. Choose to die. Right. That's what that means? Yeah, sure. So there's no compulsion, you see. They're not being forced to become Muslim. They had the choice to be killed. <laughs> wow. I love the logic, man. I'm ready to take shahada. How about you? <laughs> hey, 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 you got I a did. choice. I'll murder you or you become Muslim. Ah, oh, gee, let me think about that. Hmm. Yeah, I like my options. Well, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we trust the Holy Spirit. We use the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit will fill us like he did the holy martyrs and empower us to never betray Jesus, choose death over Islam, because that's when we live, because our Lord is alive, Muhammad is dead, which leads me to another point you made. A few more questions, and then we'll open up a Q&A. Guys, get ready with your questions. I'll tell you when. You said one of the reasons why you don't prefer Arbery is because... He translates Allah as God, even yeah. though it's not the same theological entity. Now, let me ask you questions related to this, because number one, you have Christians and in certain institutions that say that the Muslim God is our God. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, don't you have Arabic speaking Jews and Christians use Allah? So why would you say it's not the same theological entity when there are even Christians and Jews that say it's the same God? And secondly... Arabic-speaking Jews and Christians, they use Allah all the time. So why would you object? And why do you have a problem? Arab, some Arabic-speaking Jews and Christians, but not all. The Copts in Egypt are notable for avoiding the word Allah. Glory to God. And many times they say they use Rob instead, Lord, because they don't want to say Allah. And oh. so while technically it's true, that this is the this is the commonly accepted translation. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to translate, and so you know the the Trisayan, the, the one of the most ancient prayers in Christianity, Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us. It's Kudus on Ila, Kudus on Ukawi, Kudus on Ilathi, Ilathi, La Yamutur Hamna. Anyway. Kudus on Ilah, that's, there you go. So Ilah, not Allah. Yeah. The Ilah, because people may not know the difference. Yeah. It's not Allah, well, it's Ilah. Ilah, which is generic, it's not Allah. Yeah. So, but nonetheless, it's very close. Yeah. A lot of people don't even realize it's not the same thing. Mm. But this is something that is a manifestation of the Dimi mentality. Chapter 29, verse 46 of the Quran says, Say to the unbelievers, our Allah and your Allah are one. Yeah. And now we have legions of Christians who are just happy to do that. Happy to say, oh yeah, okay. 
Our law and your law are one. That's one thing. The other thing is there's a tremendous difference in the understanding of God. Not only in the in the Trinity, you know, the 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 nobody would deny, or I think very few people would deny, that Judaism and Christianity had the same God, even though the Jews don't say the Trinity and reject the Trinity. But nobody would say this is not the same God. It's the same scriptures, same prophets, etc. But when it comes to Islam, people would say the same thing. Oh, you got the same scriptures, the same prophets, but you don't have the same scriptures because Islam says that the uh, Jewish and Christian scriptures are corrupted. And the view of God, unlike in Judaism, is radically different, not just in terms of the Trinity, Leave that aside. But in terms of the nature of God himself, look at chapter 91 of the Quran. In chapter 91 of the Quran, there's a remarkable thing that it says that is often overlooked. By the sun and his brightness and the moon when she follows him and the day when it reveals him and the night when it enshrouds him and the heaven and him who built it and the earth and him who spread it out, and right. a soul, and him who perfected it, and inspired its wickedness and righteousness. Exactly. Did you catch that? Yep. That Allah inspires within the soul its wickedness and righteousness. Now, that's not just me translating the Quran wrong. Sayyid Abul Allah Maldudi, one of the foremost Islamic scholars of the 20th century, he says that this means that in the soul, the creator has placed in it tendencies to both good and evil. And I say in my note, this is sharply different from the New Testament proposition. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all in 1 John 1, 5. Because to place evil in the soul, Allah must have it to give. Exactly. And so exactly. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. That's what the Christian scriptures say. There's no way that could be the same God. And you put it in the note, by the way. This is in his commentary. It's in his note where he shows this difference. Glory to God for that. Now, let me read their note. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. 3213. I just got to give you one more. Oh, yeah. 3213. Not... Now, compare this. Well, let me read this first. You you know what I'm talking about here, Sam. Yeah, yeah, he's consigned. He's already created men for hell, men and gin for hell. Yeah. Yeah, but it's even worse. It's yep. not just that he created men and jinn for hell. It's that it's it how he, what he says about it. Yep. And if we had so willed, we could have given every soul its guidance. Now that's monstrous. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. That's evil. If we had so willed, we could have given every soul its guidance. But the word from me concerning evildoers took effect. And I will fill Gehenna with the jinn and mankind together. So he's wow. saying, I could have brought everybody to the truth. But instead, I'm going to fill hell with men. Exactly. Now, that's just, now God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what you read in the New Testament. Yeah. And so if God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, he's not going to be deciding arbitrarily to send some people to hell to torture them forever when he could have guided them to the truth. 100%. And so this is a fundamental difference. There's no way that could be the same God. And that's why I think it's it's misleading to people to use the same word. Even if you can make all kinds of etymological cases, there are other issues involved. And I just want to confirm, sadly, and I thank the Lord Jesus and his love, he's illuminated me. Sadly, we have certain systems in Christianity that argue similarly but it's not biblical. It's not ancient. And I came out of that system. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. And I pray the Lord opens hearts. More people come out of it because it's a pernicious system. It blasphemes God. But just so you understood what he said, these are in his notes, commentary and verses. The God of the Quran in his book says he put, inspired the wickedness and the good in the soul of the humans that he created. So that means evil comes from him. He is its, the source of it. And that he doesn't will everyone to be guided on the truth because he's decided beforehand to create many genies and men for hell. 
That's the God of Islam. Now, I just want to read your translation of 2946 in your note. Why this will should be in everyone's library if you're dealing with Muslims. Here it is, 2946. And I have a few more questions. Wrap it up with Q&A. And do not argue, 2946. Do not argue with the people of the book unless it be in what is better, except with those among them who do wrong. And say, we believe in what has been revealed to us and revealed to you. Our Allah and your Allah is one. And to him we are Muslims. Excellent translation, Muslims. Sadly, many people don't render the word. It is we are I'm Muslim. Muslim. Yeah. Submit. We surrender. Yeah. Excellent. So whenever the word Abraham, Muslim, in the Quran, I say Muslims. So good. it says Abraham was a Muslim in 367 and so on. So and in just so people world. understand. Some of these translations won't translate Muslim, even though it's in Arabic, they'll say submission or surrender. But you make sure every time it says Muslim, what do you do with it? It says Muslims. Thank you. That's why we're thankful. Now, let me read his note. Here's his note to 2946. Muslims, Jews, and Christians all worship the same deity. Although there are significant differences in each religion's conception of God, the Quranic assertion has come to be taken for granted... That's not me talking. That's I'm I'm giving the meaning of the verse. Yes, that's there. right. Yeah, I want to make so that I'm clear. I'm not saying that we all worship the same deity. Yes. Anyway, go yeah, ahead. I'm going to be clear from what he says. So he's saying that's what the verse is saying. Muslims, Jews, and Christians all worship the same deity. That's what the verse is saying. Now he's going to correct that lie. Although there are significant differences in each religion's conception of God, this Quranic assertion has come to be taken for granted among massive numbers of non-Muslims. The Tafsir al-Jalalain says that Muslims should not argue with Jews and Christians except by, quote, calling people to Allah by his signs and calling attention to his proofs, except the case of those of them who do wrong by fighting you and refusing to pay the jizya, in which case argue with them by means of the sword. That's how you argue with them. The verse says argue with them. The two Jalals, consider some of the greatest Sunni commentaries say, you argue with them with the sword. So you're not going to submit pages, yeah? Off with your head. And then we enslave your women and children and rape the women. <clears throat> argue with them by means of the sword until they become Muslims or pay the jizya on the Jesus C929, which leads me to this question. If the Muslims have their way, based on your studied scholarly research, debating Muslims, and you've debated the, who, who of, the who's who of Islam, and I'll mention one in a minute. You put your arguments to the test. You've engaged them in debates. Many of your debates are found online. You've studied 40 years. And in your research, if the Muslims apply this book and they become uppermost in the West, what would that look for? Look for <clears throat> look to us, I should say. We non-Muslims, if they now dominate as they're doing in the UK. You see how emboldened they are, and they have enough manpower, and they impose what the Quran says. What will that look like for us non-Muslims? How will we be treated? What will happen to us and our children? Well, Sam, you know, subservience, oppression, denial of rights, the subjugation of women, hijab, uh, all kinds of restrictions, on what jobs you can hold, poverty, low social status, wow. precarious existence subject to persecution at any point, like the Christians in Egypt, you know. In Egypt, you can just be going about your business as a Christian and be attacked, and the judge will side with the attacker. This can happen anytime, you never know, and you don't really have any recourse. Because the authorities are all Muslim. Same in Pakistan. That's what we're looking at here in the West in the future. What would they do to us? We, oh, we'd speak be, out against them. we would be killed. Right no away. mercy? Are you kidding? They would so they'd get the video cameras going and behead us slowly. Wait, uh, so you, me, and David Wood would be shish kebab on skewer, skewers? Oh, yeah. You remember that picture of the guy holding up his finger for one one Allah, and he's got all the heads on the fence behind him? That would be us. Yeah, man. yeah. disgusting. So we're you and me, forget oh. it, we're dead. David Wood is dead. Oh, yeah. Now, does the Quran allow 
them to take women captive and rape them even if they're married? Oh, well, the marriage is annulled. That's in Islamic law. A, mar a woman's marriage is annulled as soon as she's taken captive. Oh, so wow. see, Even though her husband's alive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just not married anymore because now she's the slave of the Islamic warrior. My goodness. God forbid. So if they were to conquer, that means they could take your wife, David Wood's wife, even our children, rape them at will and sell them off, and then enslave our boys, if not murder them. Because we're dying. We're going to be killed. Wow. No this doubt about it. That's absolutely right, Sam. There really isn't anything else. I mean, people say, oh, surely not. You know, that's that's a long time ago. That's one thing that I saw in the history of jihad when I was researching it. There's never been a time when they didn't behave that way, ever. So why do we think it's going to be different for us here? Yeah. And by the way, speaking of which, we have another Muhammadan manifesting like his prophet, Bassam Zawadi, whom I destroyed and annihilated, on Answering Islam, just go to answeringislam.net and watch the rebuttals. That's why he's on record. And by the way, just to let you know, I'm not lying. You ask David Wood if you want life stream, or you don't need to. They can. But Sam Zawadi told David Wood, because David Wood shared this with me, to say, we do not want to debate Sam Shimon because pretty much they're afraid of me because they know I'll annihilate them. So they make excuses not to debate by saying I'm mean. He even told David Wood, and you can ask him privately, sure. but something public, Basam Zawadi, because David Wood and Basam Zawadi met each other, and he said, Sam Shimon, the Muslims are afraid to debate him. We're afraid to debate him because basically I go for the juggler. So we don't mm -hmm. debate him, and we make excuses by saying he's mean. Now, that's me. Now, with you, you've debated the creme de la creme, the who's who. You're even supposed to debate Shabir Ali. What happened? Yeah. What Shabir, backed out. Shabir backed out, but I do have to say that last November, I think it was, I debated Javad Hashmi, this uh, this guy, Harvard grad student, yeah. and that was kind of ridiculous. He was talking all about American politics as if it was Christianity, and it was sort of a circus. But in any case, after that, Shabir contacted the people who ran that debate, and he wanted to set something up. But we could never settle on a topic that was mutually agreeable. So I'm willing to debate Shabir, but it's got to be something that's it hasn't been done a million times. You 100%. know, he wanted to talk about the uh, Old Testament being just you know more violent, and I'd just done that with Hashmi and Christianity being more violent and all that nonsense. And yep. uh, it would seem like it was it seemed like it was going to be a rerun. But when we actually had it set up in Toronto a few years back. And I was all set to debate him. Yes, he backed out. Yep. And since then, uh, Nadir Ahmed contacted me and said, why don't you debate Shabir? And I said, sure, set it up. I never. He said, I'll get back to you soon. He never got back to me. Yeah. You know, yeah. So I think like Shabir, uh, yeah, just like he was going to get back to Christian Prince. And one tactic of Shabir Ali, and I tell Christians don't fall for it. He'll either debate two topics in one, like a Christian Islamic topic in one, to put you on the defensive. Yes. Or he'll agree to debate Christian topics, but the coward rarely, if at all, because now people are being putting pressure on him, will he rarely debate just a straight-up Islamic topic like jihad and Islam. It's got to be two topics in one or a Christian topic, but rarely, but some have put pressure. No, no, no. We're going to do, okay, violence in the Bible one day, violence in Islam another day. Tawheed and another mm. day Trinity. Because he likes to do two topics in one to focus on attacking so he doesn't defend. Or he'll debate you just on Christian topics because the man is slimy. I can say that. You, you're more professional than me and better looking. Let me be the <laughs> one. I'm slimy. I so don't know about that. I thought that he was real slimy, actually, when he... Uh, didn't we talk about his response to Did Muhammad Exist some time ago? Yes. On my channel, that, yes. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, it seemed like he was, you know, very dishonest in his dealing with the materials, but that's not to oh, be he is. No, no surprise, really. I've documented it on my writings and sessions. I've quoted him how he lies, deceives, misrepresents, and he thinks he can get away with it. And sadly, some Christians do, but not us. We hold his feet to the fire. We will spiritually shish kebab him. Oh, what book? Anyway, brother, my questioning <clears throat> from my end, is done. If you have a few minutes, 
I'll let the people ask you questions if you have, because I know you're a busy man. Brethren, okay. if you have questions, put them in the comments. I'll bring them up, but try to make it relevant to the critical Quran and the themes that we touched upon, such as jihad, women, the term Allah, things that are relevant. And again, let me show you what it looks like. And we're going to go to his channel because there was other books he recommended. The critical Quran. Get it? Support this brother and read the notes and use them for the glory of Christ to inoculate Christians and non-Muslims to see the true face of Islam and share them with Muslims because there are Muslims who don't know that the, this is what their religion teaches. They're shocked. They're shocked to know their religion teaches this. And so, thankfully, many, many leave. Sadly, many become terrorists, but our prayer is that all of them leave and find their only hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to show your page again because you also recommend it, not just this one. Now, Protestant believer, if you can go to this page on Amazon. And guys, get ready to ask your questions. Not, we're going to wrap up. I mean, you're a superstar. You got over 300 people watching. I, I don't get the numbers that David Wood used to get because he had 500,000. He'd get 1,000. Well, if you look at it statistically, 500,000 subscribers, that's not much. And tell them I'm hating on him, and I'm still better looking. Anyway, <laughs> go to Robert Spencer, if you can put it in. And <clears throat> we're going to look at some of the books. And I'm going to ask him, which books would he th say are top prior? I mean, all his books are great. But which, if you recommend two or three books for those engaging Muslims, which two or three would that be? So look at his oh, name. Very yeah. simple, yeah. Uh, the Critical Quran. And then the truth about Muhammad. Okay, scroll down. For the understanding that Muslims have of the uh, look at that young guy. Wow. Yeah. Long time. You can ago. scroll down. It's um, not going to scroll down by itself, Protestant. I love you, man. Don't do to Rob Spencer what you do to me, sir. Okay. <laughs> Critical Quran. Critical Quran. That's one. Yes. What else? Truth about Muhammad. Keep going. The truth about Muhammad. The biography of Muhammad based on the Islamic sources. So you understand what they believe about Muhammad. And then going on to history of jihad. Those three. So you get the Quran, Muhammad, and the history. So those three top recommendations, get them, study them, use them in your witnessing to Muslims and non-Muslims. So here's one question that may be related. You may have covered in the book. When is Robert going to document the effect of jihad in Nigeria, Pakistan, Indonesia? Well, I do that every day at jihadwatch.org. You can go to jihadwatch.org, and there is absolutely extensive, years-long files on uh, articles of jihad activity in Nigeria, Pakistan, Indonesia, and elsewhere. Uh, I hope to one day be able to put all that into another book. We'll see if it happens. Do you cover some of that in the book? Because obviously Islam expanded to those areas centuries ago in the history of jihad. Yeah, to some degree, but I was running out of space. Oh, I see. I had mm -hmm. space constraints. And I so uh, it's primarily India and those areas, Europe and the Americas. Yeah. Now, someone asked me a question. I don't want to answer that. But I'll let you answer ones that are related. And by the way, do you have Twitter that's with the Jihad Watch? That's yeah, Jihad Watch, RS. Jihad Watch RS. Okay, That's Jihad Watch RS. W A T C H R S on Twitter. So s go and to it. Get in uh, fights there with the Twitter yeah. jihadis. So go there, support the brother prayerfully, financially on his Patreon. It'll be found there, and engage the Muslims there using the information mm -hmm. that God has given you. Now, here's the question again. And someone asked a question that I don't think I want to answer, but maybe you think it's worth answering, but I'll ask it after this. Brother Spencer, what is the root of the name of Allah? Is it even Arabic? Well, there's a lot of dispute about that. In the first place, you have Allah, the God. And so that's why we were talking about Elah and Allah with the Christian prayers in Arabic uh, a little while ago. But Allah, it's disputed as to whether it's Arabic in origin or if it's something else. And also it's etymologically connected to Alat, who is one of the goddesses of the Quraysh, the satanic verses, goddesses yeah. that Muhammad said to worship. And then he uh, changed his mind and said that uh, Satan had inspired all that. 
But in any case, it's possible that all of this, all of it, including Allah, was borrowed from outside and has no Arabic root at all. Speaking of which, by the way, God willing, tomorrow I'm working with Prat to see his schedule. I'm doing part two of my response to Ali Atai on the satanic verses. So this is a good plug. So Lord willing, I'm going to be doing part two to show that these are based on sound chains according to Islamic criteria of authenticity. So pray for that, Lord willing. Let's make that session go viral. It's going to be part two. Now, here is some more questions that are relevant. Here goes. Do you think when Islam attempts to attack America, do you think they'll try and convert people or do you think they'll fight them? Because I feel either way, the Americans are going to be using guns. So what's coming yeah, first, conversion or attack? Neither one. Mm. What's happening now is how it's happening. What's mm. happening now is that you are getting Muslims in positions of influence and power, and they are turning things the way they want, and that will continue, and there will be um, strife about it, probably, as there have been in other societies. But it seems as if there's been a general understanding in the United States that they're getting everything they want without armed jihad, and so they don't need to go jihad. They don't need to be violent. Wow. And so you have, you know, you have the president of the United States promising to appoint Muslims in positions at every level of his administration. And he's telling, he's talking to a Muslim Brotherhood linked group when he says that. And the Muslim Brotherhood's plan for the United States in its own words is eliminating and destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house. So all these saboteurs have been appointed to various levels of this administration and they're going about their sabotage. And this is what they said they were going to do. It's what they're doing with the end. By the way, that Muslim Brotherhood document says sabotaging its miserable house by their own hands and the hands of the believers. So in other words, their plan always was to get the unbelievers to sabotage their own house. That's what's happening. And that's how it's happening right now. Which tells me, do you think these liberals know this and are deliberately in bed to collapse Western values that they also want yeah. to destroy? So yeah, I don't think they could be so idi such idiots. I think they really want to destroy the place. They wow. believe in socialism, in internationalism, and in all these things that the United States is against or has been against historically. So they're hollowing it out from within and making it not against these things. Wow. Yeah, that's a tradition. I discussed that in Did Muhammad Exist? Was Muhammad's real name Kutam? Uh, that's a tradition. That's in this. It's it's one of the Islamic traditions about Muhammad. And so you gotta wonder, you know, when you're thinking that Muhammad's a historical character, why would anybody ever make up a story like that? Yeah. And say, oh, he originally had another name, and then we started calling him Muhammad. Unless maybe one of the people whose traditions were taken and put into the story of Muhammad was named Kutham. And the name appeared somewhere, and they had to explain it. So they said, oh, he was originally called that. I see. Here's another question. Robert Spencer, what are your greatest challenges being a Christian apologist? Do you get travel bans a lot? Do you get death threats? Do you have friends and family that wants you to stop? In fact, mention how you got poisoned. Uh, and tell them about that because a lot yeah. of people don't know you got poisoned. Yeah, uh, they tried to get me twice, actually. In 2015... Uh, I was the co a lot of people don't know this, but I was the co sponsor and one of the speakers of the Muhammad art exhibit and cartoon contest in Texas that was the first ISIS attack in America. Uh, Pamela Geller and I were working together to put that out, put that event on, and the jihadis came from Phoenix to attack us. And so that was the first time. And then 2017, there were, uh, it was, uh, I was speaking in Iceland, and it was a leftist in that case oh, wow. who slipped something into my drink. I was very sick for a while, but uh, anyway, it got better. Thank God. Oh, Lord, save uh, you. Preserve the you. Uh, thing is, yeah, I would also have, of course, the ban from Britain, which is because I got a letter. I was right here at this desk, and I got a letter from the UK Home Office that said, uh, you have 
said that Islam has doctrines of warfare against unbelievers, and we have reason to believe that you're going to say it again if you come to Britain, so you ain't coming. And so it's kind of a shame because um, it's like I'm a criminal, and of course I'm not. And yeah. so what I mean is I oftentimes see Islamic apologists saying, this guy is so extreme and so hateful that he was banned from entering Britain. Well, actually, they let all kinds of jihadis in all the time because they're subservient and scared. And yes. they didn't let me in because I was saying these truths they didn't want known. But it does; it is a major irritant because like American Airlines, don't fly American Airlines if you can avoid it. Uh, American Airlines is tied to British Airways. <coughs> and so every time really? if I have to, yeah. And so if I have to fly American Airlines, sometimes it's unavoidable. I'm actually going to be flying them again in a few weeks. I have to give an hour or two ahead of time. I have to go early because they give me the third degree and I have this huge weight because they act like I'm a terrorist. Let me for that. You're telling me American Airlines Associated British Airways, they give you a Christian who loves this country and its traditional values and trying to fight for its protection. They give you a hard time, so you have to go there two hours and they drill you because they are aware of your ban in the UK because American Airlines works with British Airways. Yeah, they told me once that it's if they want to avoid uh, that I'll sneak into Britain. As if I have any interest in doing that. I can tell you right now, I have no interest in going to that place ever again. It's it's done for. But uh, in any case, yeah, that's the idea. That wow. and, and so for some reason, I have to have this huge weight and questioning and all kinds of things to keep me from going and sneaking into Britain. But um, that's all just, you know, that's just harassment. And uh, <laughs> the harassment is... Uh, kind of an annoyance but you know on the same at the same time if it weren't for the fact that i know that i'm telling the truth this yeah. would be unbearable but since i know that i'm telling the truth i know you know you can look back in history and there are all kinds of people who have had trouble for telling the truth i've really had it pretty easy yeah glory to god and may the lord continue to bless mm -hmm. you open doors and extend your life on earth to be used for the glory of christ and i pray that for us these are will be the two final questions that are related. Okay, so he asks, how are the Russians holding power when 20% of their population are Muslim and they have pro-Islam laws? And do you find it disturbing that Putin is developing a strong friendship with the Taliban? Well, you know, every non-Muslim state in the world that plays ball with these guys and thinks they can control them. And I think that that is actually uh very common more common than people think they're gonna be surprised right now the big threat to our freedom in the west is not islam it's the left yeah, and how the left is trying to destroy the united states as a free republic criminalize opposition and so on and that's yep. that's the big threat right now but if they think that then they will sit back and enjoy the spoils after they destroy us with the muslims they're going to be very surprised. Exactly. It's just like in the, take, for example, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. In Iran, the Tuda party, which was communists, allied with Khomeini. And then Khomeini had them all put in prison. And I think that the left is in for that <laughs> in the West. Sadly. That uh, there, a lot of their friends and allies are going to suddenly say, you know, we don't really like all this lgbtq business and all that stuff and you're 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 you guys are going to jail or worse yeah i'd kind of like to say something there um Go ahead. Yep, sure. they're not they're not counting on the right um because <clears throat> they're being really quiet but i'm here to tell you um we're here <laughs> and we're not going away yeah. don't say too much man you don't want them to monitor to you man <laughs> Uh, anyway, besides that, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Spencer, I, I left a link there uh, in the oh, yeah, let me, let me right that Can I'd you like bring it up to or check no? out. Um, it's called Art it of Imposture. No? Yeah, um, it's called Art of Imposture Film. dot com. Um, I'd like for you to go check it out because you were actually an inspiration to this. 
you and Osama Dakdok were an inspiration to this film that uh, uh, we developed a couple years ago. Um, That's not that film uh, that is all mixed up with Benghazi, is it? No, no. Oh, no, no. no. Okay. No, sir. These were these are guys Christians who took sort of actual footage of jihadis murdering, killing, raping. Yep. Put it together, thanks to your research and Osama Dakdok, but it got banned from YouTube. Every time they try to put it up, YouTube removes it. Yeah, no surprise there. We we went out and got our own domain. Well, he went out and got his own domain. I'm not going to actually say who did it, but uh, he went out and got his own domain and put it up up there. And uh, I definitely you need to go check it out. Um, Thank you. You were you were definitely an an inspiration to the making of this film. So, glory to God. Now, final question. You don't have to answer it because it's more of a theo- theological and eschatological. Do you think he's asking? I'm not going to answer it, but if you want to, if not, we can ignore it. It's not relevant. Maybe you think really? it is. Uh, I'm, I lost it, but it was. Do you think that the Mahdi will be the Antichrist when Jesus returns? So I don't well, know. You if know you there is a hadith that says that nobody is going to be worse in the sight of Allah on the day of judgment than the one who's calls himself the king of kings. Yeah. So well, you got to think, you know, it seems to me there's an awful lot. It's not just that, but there's an awful lot that is kind of a one-to-one uh, Christian eschatology and Islamic eschatology are mirror images of each other. And so maybe they'll be uh, working together. I mean, not not working together. I mean, maybe it'll all go together and all happen the way that it's written with one, with them complimenting one. I'm, I'm not being able to explain what I mean. I mean that it's like one's the flip side of the other. And yeah. so when they say there's nobody worse than the king of kings on the day of judgment, well, obviously that's the king of kings in Christianity. And so yeah. might be a very surprising time. So glory to God. Now here's what I want to ask of you. How can people support you? How can they pray for you and encourage you to continue to do your ministry? Because your voice is a rare voice and it's being drowned out. We need to take advantage of the doors that are open by the grace of God before they're shut and we can't do anything anymore. So what can they do for you to show their appreciation? How can they thank you? How can they pray for you? How can they support you? Well, I certainly appreciate it if people can sign on to Patreon, and I'm going to try to do more with it. Uh, and that you can find my name on Patreon. If you um, give me the link, I'll just put it in the description box. Do you have it somewhere? Or is it I can find it real quick. Um, yeah, there, no, there it is. Hang on. And send it to me in private chat, and I'll post it. Okay, let's see here. And also, as far as the prayers go for perseverance and hope and all those good things. There it goes. Here's this Patreon, guys. I'm going to share it right now, and I'll put it in the description box. We we do appreciate prayers, support, because he's trying to do the work of the Lord. And he'll tell you, trying to be an apologist and getting finance is the hardest thing to do. And we don't have a multi-million dollar organization. Right. You have to raise up your own support and you have to pay out to people to even do some research for you. And that costs money. And you don't have a mega organization bringing in donors to support and financing you. Correct? Well, I don't have any organization. And not only that, but. Um, well, I'm grateful to say that I'm affiliated with the Horowitz Freedom Center. But at the same time, I want to say that uh, the left and the Islamic groups in the United States, like the Council on American Islamic Relations, and the leftist groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center, they're always trying to shut down our sources of funding yeah. and, yeah. Uh, you know, claim that we're uh, hateful and that's the people shouldn't be allowed to donate and so on. We're always up against that. And then people get scared to donate and so on. So anybody that can help out, it's very gratefully yeah, received and much needed. Support this man's work. Now, glory to God, our brother Dave Wood. He's strong. May his support stay steady. But there's some are not there yet he's one of them that's trying to work there we want to help him achieve his goal and don't forget also pray that god will sustain me so i can care for my daughters now brother just let him know tomorrow wednesday this is a weekly thing you do on your youtube channel right yeah that's right i mean you know it depends on uh 
our schedules last week, I had something I had to do Wednesday. And so we did it Thursday and I haven't talked to David this week. So I'm assuming it'll be tomorrow night. It probably will be tomorrow night, but you can watch for announcements tomorrow after I clear it with David. Yes. Go to his YouTube channel. I'll put the links to his Patreon YouTube channel and uh, Jihad Watch. He does a weekly show on Jihad. Now, for the record, you can tell him I said this. David doesn't need to come and help this man with Jihad. The man is an encyclopedia. David is doing it because he wants to get attention because you know how it is. It's all about me. I'm the great white hope. So Robert Spencer, put me on. If not, then I won't work with you because I'm just great. I think David's yeah. doing me a favor, actually. Yeah, man. Oh, glory to God. You're actually blessing us because it's your research that helped David and my, me because you can't be an expert in every field of Islam. And I definitely, one of my weakest areas is the history of jihad. So that's why God raises up brothers like you because we're the body and we're interdependent. We are not mm -hmm. independent and we're completely dependent on the Lord. So the Lord uses your gifts to bless me. Had not been free, honestly, because when it comes to history of jihad, oh, I am you. stupid. So I thank you for your work. I pray I can bless you even more in more ways than just bringing you on because I mean this. I've said it behind your back in front of you. You are, in my estimation, the leading scholar and voice on the history of jihad and other aspects of Islam. And people don't know what a gift you are to the church and they need to get your books and subscribe and support you because you're a rare gift and i mean that so i praise god for you thanks very much thanks for sam very kind of you really i much appreciate it and of course it all goes double for you thank you but don't forget though when we did that show on what was it uh the 30 day thing what was it we did with david wood you and me yeah the, uh, uh homicide homicide. you you saw how i put terror and fear in your heart the great sheikh don't you deny it you had nightmares you couldn't sleep when i was the it chef was oh, it was a lot of fun it was it was hopefully great we'll I, hope, uh, I hope we'll be able to do another someday yeah hopefully because you know what i stole the show you guys were just pathetic i was the star don't hate i did halal you hogan did. and i did the sheikh dude you did steal the show sam you did hey i love this guy man if i start a fan club you're gonna be the president but well, god bless That's you brother it. Thank the you. Lord willing, I'll bring you on for another topic. We'll talk behind the scenes. So, Lord bless you. Watch over you now, Protestant. Any prayer requests for you? Because we're going to wrap it up. Prayer requests for my, our brothers. My channel is called Jihad Watch TV. Yep, we're going. I'm going to put the links in the description box, and I'll pin them as a comment. So, any prayer Somebody, requests for you, brother? Yes, I pray that everybody here go out and and get Robert Spencer's books, all of them now, Hallelujah. please. Support the brother. Thank you guys. Love you guys. And Lord willing, Protestant, send me a message when you're free tomorrow, if you are. So we can do Ali Atai, the fraud exposed, satanic verses. We love you. And remember this. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again, physically body to judge the living and the dead. May we be in love with the Lord, yielded to the spirit, and may the blood of Christ wash us and our loved ones, in my case, my daughters, so that we walk worthy of the Lord. So when he sees us and he sees Robert, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. We love you. Take care.